I'm very, very pleased uh, to introduce uh, the speakers on this panel. As you can see, the uh, topic will be mainly translation and African languages. Um, to my uh, far left, Kwadjo Oseinyame, he's not on the program, but he has joined us uh, last minute, who will introduce his paper himself. Uh, Martin Olwin, who will also uh, speak on behalf of Mr. Hassan Dahir Ismail Wetsame, uh, whose paper is called Form and Feeling in Translating Somali Poetry. Ms. Uh, Sophie Alal, who will speak about reclaiming tongues. Uh, then Dr. Wangui Wagoro, I don't think I need to tra um, introduce her, she's already spoken in the morning, but um, to my knowledge, she's one of the most famous uh, translators from African languages, so I'm very pleased to uh, introduce her um, uh, on this panel. Um, then we have Mr. Richard Odwar, who is himself a writer. Um, by the way, uh, best, best regards from Jeff Ryman, who is very sorry that he cannot be here. So I thought I would uh, tell you about that. And then the discussant is Dr. Shege Githiora. Okay, so um, I would like to ask the speakers to um, uh, speak for about 10, maximum 15 minutes. If you can target at 12, I think it will be perfect. Uh, from this position, I cannot really wave at you much for if you go to speak at the lectern, so please just uh, time, uh, keep the time um, as strictly as possible. Um, Richard, would you like to be the first speaker? Uh, hello, everyone. Um, I'm Richard. Uh, Richard Oduram from Jalada, Africa, uh, from Nairobi. So... <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I just came yesterday and there's a crisis going on there. So I'm um, going to talk about Jalada's translation work. And I'm going to talk about the possibilities for translations in the digital age. Uh, so we've been given uh, 10 to 12 minutes. Uh, I'm yeah. going to try to <laughs> fix. We had been told it's 15. We were told before <laughs> it would be 15, but I'll fix everything within 10 minutes. So a uh, few weeks ago, Google launched uh, Bluetooth earbuds called the Pixel Buds. And the developers announced that the technology had the ability of translating over 40 languages simultaneously from one earphone to another. That if one, that I could speak in one language and 40 different people Speaking different languages could comprehend what I was saying in their language. Another company called Bragi released their own version called Dash Pro Earbuds, which they branded as true wireless intelligent earphones. Now, this application had the ability to translate over 40 languages simultaneously. Uh, there's another application called Microsoft Skype Translator which is touted to have the ability to translate into 50 languages. Now, when we talk about translations in relation to technology, uh, these are the applications that come to mind. And for those who have been the netizens, those who use internet all the time, uh, Google Translate is one of those technologies that has become part of our everyday uh, trying to understand texts that you find either in emails that are not your language. Now, what the recurring characteristics in these technologies is that they are utilizing developments in machine learning and artificial intelligence, and that they seek to break the barriers between languages, the barriers between people, and the barriers between translating cultures. Now, one of the problems with these uh, applications is that they remove speech uh, from the process of communication. And to achieve uh, a simultaneous literal translation from one language to another. And there are commentators who have likened these technologies to the bubble fish in uh, the Hitchhiker's Guide uh, to the Galaxy, 
uh, in which you know the creature there that secretes uh, simultaneous like secretion into the ear canals and then the people in that world are supposed to understand what everybody means without going through different languages. And the The ability of translation technologies to translate meaning was first put to test during the early days of computational linguistics. When Alta Vista, a web search engine that came before Google was asked to translate the sentence, uh, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak, uh, from English to Russian, it gave the literal equivalent of, the vodka is excellent, but the meat is lousy. <laughs> Uh, now, we, we both know that's, that was not the intended meaning of that sentence. Now, the loss of meaning and misrepresentations is one of the biggest challenges uh, when you're using technology in translations. And so, one of the ways in which this can be solved, especially for uh, literary translations, is uh, having a hybrid between technology and then human expertise. So while such technologies are useful in the literal transfers of meaning in knowledge-oriented genres of writing like encyclopedic entries, standard academic texts and newspapers, they're not particularly useful in literary translations because the core linguistic operations, operations uh, are both literal and metaphoric and employ complex forms of writing when embedding meaning into texts. Literary translations demand not just the promise and capabilities of translation techniques, but more importantly, the, great, the greater capabilities of contextual meaning making. As Professor Ngugi Wadhiyongo reminded us, languages are not just objects, are not, are not inert objects used simply for communication. Rather, every language is both a carrier of communication and a carrier of culture. The second problem has always been the invisibility of African languages in these developments. Therefore, utilizing uh, technology in translation work to increase representation of African languages requires a hybrid approach that employs both the expertise of literary translations and the capabilities of new digital platforms. Now, since the 1990s, standalone or network computers have grown to become new playgrounds for for thriving literatures. These literatures have a tendency to work against or challenge the dominating tendencies of publishing and scholarship. For instance, while print publishing has stringent boundaries, digital publishing presents opportunities for breaking these established boundaries. While traditional uh, publishing is still controlled by the traditional power actors, like publishers, like literary agents and distributors, uh, digital publishing is adaptive, fluid, and suspicious of gatekeepers. While traditional publishing format is limited to text, digital literatures can exist in multiple forms, uh, can exist in multiple forms as texts or audiovisual uh, productions in both web and mobile platforms. Now, the Jalada translations issue was enabled by these capabilities uh, it was grounded on the understanding that translation is a process through which language transports meanings from one culture to another. We were cognizant of the politics around the hierarchies of languages, but we were more interested in the idea that translation can offer space for languages to meet and converse and share meanings. Instead of starting another debate on the reasons why those under production in African languages, we opted for what our managing editors called a practical vision, where our main focus is on doing the translation as opposed to uh, enumerating the countless reasons why that could not be done. So we, our approach was an experimental approach. So we began by building a network of translators, editors, and proofreaders across the continent. Uh, we started with emails to friends that we had worked with before in early anthologies. And then these emails created a web of digital identities that crossed both language and physical geographies. 
So the web, the web platform is both a space for publication and an enabler of cross-cultural communication and networking offered as a dynamism that the static book format could not. Uh, publishing online provided multiple pages that could be updated periodically as translations in different languages were submitted, edited, proofread, and published. Our first translation issue featured a short story by Professor Ngugi Wadiongo. Uh, the short story uh, translated into English uh, was written in Ikikuyu uh, and then translated into English by the author and called The Upright Revolution, or Why Humans Walk Upright. In the end, after four, four months of painstaking work, we published uh, translations in 33 languages, and this became the single most translated story in the history of African writing. But because this was an ongoing project, the translations continued as we reached out to more people, and Currently, as we speak now, uh, the short story has been translated into 70 languages. These 70 languages are spoken in 30 countries, and 49 of those 70 languages, or 70%, are African languages. Some of these languages are supranatural in their reach and use. Some cross a few national boundaries, and some lie within the geography of a single country. But more importantly, each of these languages house the diverse ways in which humans have always mapped their realities and imaginations. All these translations are available for free online on the Jalada Africa website, and we continue to invite readers and scholars to enjoy, review, and critique, and to capture not only the beauty of form of these languages, mm -hmm. we continue to update the pages with audio versions of these translations. Uh, during the Jalada Mobile uh, Literary and Arts Festival, which was, uh, we executed in five different countries for a whole month in East Africa, uh, this story was uh, performed, was adapted for stage and performed in nine languages. So we are trying to uh, bend the genres and we are trying to find in ways in which Stories that appear only in text can take other forms. Now, all experiments are a response to specific problems in the society. In this case, uh, the problem that we identified was the underrepresentation of human imaginations in African languages. Now, experiments can borrow from what has existed before or can create a new paradigm that changes how things are done. So, while we viewed this as an experiment. Uh, it doesn't mean that we didn't have a firm theoretical grounding in what we were doing. Rather, we were adopting a more scientific approach in which ideas are tested uh, in the laboratory of human production, and then the best ways of doing something naturally uh, come up from trying to adopt the very best uh, alternatives in creating and then disseminating these literatures in multiple platforms. Now the translation work is just beginning. We hope that we will stimulate interest in translations within and outside the continent, and especially in African languages. We believe that the future lies in utilizing these diverse web and mobile platforms and applications to advance the literary course. And maybe one day in the future, humans will succeed in developing AI-powered translation systems that are capable of detecting the nuances of literary text, both the complexities of language and cultural ideas that make us uniquely human in this pale blue dot, or as the American astronomer called it, the mote of dust suspended in a sunbeam. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much for your paper. Uh, and thank you for keeping the time very well. Uh, the next speaker is uh, my colleague Martin Owen from SOAS, who will talk about Somali poetry. Um, why? Yagrani of Somali. Kofna, why? Okay, um, I'm going to speak today um, about translating Somali poetry. Uh, it's a massive topic, uh, there's not a lot of time, and I was going to be doing it with a friend of mine, 
Hassan Daher Smail Wet Summit. Sadly, he's stuck in Addis Ababa. He was refused a visa to come here. He lives in Hargeisa and he gone to Addis to try and get his visa, but he's uh, so he won't be here. Uh, but we will be reading his poem this evening at the reading, Galilio uh, Catastrophe, that we did with the Poetry Translation Centre. Right. Um, form and feeling in Somali poetry, in translating Somali poetry. The, the first thing I would say about translating, I think anything, but certainly my own sense in translating Somali poetry is, about, is there's one word, is responsibility. It's a massive responsibility. And it's responsibility at different levels. You've got a responsibility to the poem, a responsibility to the poet, and with Somali, you've even got a responsibility to the language. And I'm just going to read a very short quotation from a, uh, a review of a book, of a collection of translated Somali poems, which came out in 1994. And um, the reviewer says in this review, all in all, the anthology provides ample proof that poetry of a high order, though not of the highest, can flourish in an oral tradition. I mean, to have such a prejudicial and just an absolutely stunningly awful statement in world literature today of all journals is absolutely stunning. And I always remember when I first read that, I thought, what? And um, so it's part of what led me onto the road of really sort of engaging more with Somali poetry translation myself. Some of the translations that I'd seen from the past, whilst done by people who knew the language very well, just didn't sort of start to gel. Once I started to get to know the, 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 the language well enough to, to feel the poetry in the language. That, of course, takes time. It takes time for somebody like me, who comes to the language later on in life, to really start to feel what's going on. And you have to study and study and study and study, and then do more. <laughs> and that's what I did. And I'm basically today just going to talk a little bit about three poems, one that I'm sort of actually in the process of translating, one that I have tra and two that I've actually already translated. And uh, <clears throat> now the first thing to say, it's interesting I'm listening this morning, is that the, the whole language issue just doesn't figure in this. If you're Somali and you're out in the countryside and you want to make a poem, you do it in Somali. There's just simply no question. You're not going to know any other language, let alone actually have the discussion about whether to do something in English or whatever. Uh, the most famous Somali poets today are not particularly well-known outside of the Somali territories. One or two, maybe... I mean, every, I imagine everyone in the room here has heard of Nuruddin Farah, but maybe not many people have heard of uh, Mohammed Ibrahim Bar Barsame Hadrawi. Has anyone heard of Hadrawi? Right. If there was this number of people in Somalia, and I said, who's heard of Hadrawi? Everyone would put their hand up. Who's heard of Nudim Farah? A few people would put their hand up. Who's actually heard a poem by Hadrawi? Everyone would put their hand up. Who's read a novel by Nudim Farah? Possibly two people might put their hand up. So this is the context that I'm coming from. Why? So I want you to all now imagine that you're basically in the Somali territories in the 19th century and that you have, uh, basically, you're, you're feeling very sorry for yourself, okay? If you're a man, but this is a poem by a man, and the woman he was going to marry, who he's in love with, had been married to another woman. So if you're a woman, you can imagine it the other way around, or if you're, you wouldn't know, imagine it in our own way. <laughs> okay, so what he says, Al-layl dumay al Alif Now I'm just going to translate those for you, or give the working translation that I've got at this point in time. So night has fallen, and behind closed doors everyone was sleeping. Thunder called out, a clamour of rain, shots from a thousand rifles. Now the next line in this poem is, for me, it's quite frankly one of the most beautiful sound objects that I've ever come across. He says, I do not know how to translate this. The other lines I can translate. <laughs> now, I know what it means. It's actually quite clear. The language is straightforward. But listen to it. The feeling in, in there... Even hopefully some of it comes across, just as I say it to you now, the assonance, just the sheer musicality 
of those words. And so this is now, how on earth do you get that into a translation? So I pose that as a question. This, of course, happens with all the lines in this poem and indeed any other poem that's worth its salt. Of course, not there's good poetry and bad poetry in Somali as just as in any other language. And I only put good poems to translate. So, um, so th but that feeling is the feeling of a man in the 19th century. And we can be pretty confident those are his actual words, even though he, he, he knew how to read and write Arabic as far as we know. He was well educated uh, Islamically. But he, there was no reading and writing of Somali in those days, apart from possibly just little bits in people where, where people did it a little bit in Arabic. But not unlike Swahili and Hausa, we don't have any um, manuscript tradition in Somali like we do uh, with, with those other languages. So now the other thing about that is this is a long line. Let me turn now to another poem. And this is a poem. We don't know who first made this poem. This is, a, this is part of the, the sort of general heritage of the people. And for this one, you need to imagine that your whole life literally revolves around your livestock, particularly camels. Camels are the most important uh, livestock to the Somali nomads. Sheep and goats are also very important, but the, the camels are, are the ultimate, they, they are simply the most important. Now, when, when the camels have not drunk for a long time and they're taken to a well, they'll first drink very quickly. And then they go off and they sit down and the water sort of gets into their system. Then they'll come back and they'll drink some more. And so the men, it's always the men that look after the camels, they will <coughs> take the water out of the well, put it in a trough, and the camels will drink again. And they will sing to the camels. And there's lots of these sort of short poems, stroke songs. The distinction is not as clear-cut in Somali. And one of them, I, I'm going to just read it, and then I'm going to sort of perform it as it would normally be performed. So it's, Anigu aregan ku adeyon ku That's it. And they were singing, Allah ani ku adegan ho ebe ho ku adeyon ku akchugeya ho ebe. And they'll sing these things to their, their camels. Now, what does this mean? Ani ku, I, adega, you, ba, focus. Ku adeya, I obey you. Ku akchugeya, I stand by you. That's it. So I translated this. This is very simple. The language is so simple, and yet it's so profound in the context. And again, the language is not an issue. You're talking to your camel. Now, okay, camels don't speak Somali, but you're Somali, and that camel is going to hear you. And they do, and they, the camels are so, so precious. People, you know, they're never mistreated. I mean, they're, they're handled from a, a, since they're, from the, when they're born, the, the camels. So they're used to being there. They'd be quite sort of grumpy things, camels, on their own. But you, they, so if you say that, then your own experience and your whole relationship with the camel is presented in, in, these, in, in, in such a sort of simple and yet very profound way. So I translated this very simply as, I, you, obey. I stay by you. And hopefully the feeling of it, the sort of simplicity, and yet one of the things there is that the, it's a short meter. All this poetry is all metrical. And this is one of the shortest meters. La 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 la, la 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 la. So trying to get something of that into the translation is, is important as well. And the final poem I'm just going to sort of mention a little bit about is the one that we're going to read tonight, uh, Galilio, uh, by uh, Word Summit. <clears throat> now, this is in a sort of intermediate meter. It's a short line meter, so there's alliteration in each line. There's just, just one alliterative word. There's a whole issue of alliteration and how that works in Somali poetry. Uh, but there's some lines uh, particularly that um, were challenging when translating this. And he says, "Go go da ayo gadure, good good is so galab arabi. Marke galu ye jubleidu, kiyu san gelega kenta mian garashadu ye nintasara gibala de kugichi." 
when the bustard calls out from the bush to warn of the heavy spring showers, the gales and afternoon downpours, are you not grown up enough to know to tighten the roof mat on the frame of your hut? Now, the feeling of this is he's admonishing people. This poem is about Tahrib. It's about the, the um, what are sometimes so be regular migrations, etc., from Africa as a whole, but particularly there's a lot of people come from the Horn of Africa. And this poem is about people who have been killed in the Mediterranean and on that perilous journey that we've all heard about in the news. But this is a Somali voice talking about it. You'll hear the full poem this evening. But the way that he's expressing this is in yet another meter. So he's doing it in this rhythmic way. But the, the point is that the, the whole form and the way that he's crafted the language means that when people hear it, they're not just hearing words. And just like any poetry, I'm the same in English or in French or in Arabic or in, in Swahili and, 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 Ga, and any language where we're making poetry. You're crafting it such that you are really presenting your message as powerfully as possible. So how do you actually get that across in the translation? And really, just to sort of throw out there, to me, one of the most important things that I feel is to try and counter these sort of awful statements like in, this, in, this, um, in that review that I mentioned, is, is to obviously do one's best to make a translation that comes across well in the target language but to try and get the flow of language and the feeling through as far as possible. And that doesn't always mean that you're actually sort of translating it very literally. It means that lines, sometimes you need to change the lines. Maybe you sometimes need to add lines. I've done translations where, in fact, Galileo is one, where there's actually quite a few more lines in the English than there are in the original Somali. But when I read it to, to Word Summer in Hargeisa, which I did in the summer, he didn't notice that. It's, it doesn't matter you've got a few extra lines or maybe you have a few less. As long as the flow of the language, everything is there, and that flow and that sheer sort of power comes through. So I, mean, I throw that out as sort of questions and statements, and it's all been uh, sort of very quick. Uh, hopefully you've got a little sense of Somali poetry. I can recommend it to everyone to go away and read uh, Somali poetry. Actually, on the Poetry Translation website, there's, uh, there's, there's quite a bit there that um, I've been involved with and, and quite a few others have been involved with as well. And we'll be reading the whole of this poem this evening. So, Wad Mahatantin. Salaman. Thank you very much, Martin. Our next speaker is Ms. Sof Sophie Alal. Yeah, it's a pleasure to be here, and uh, I'm very grateful for the opportunity to uh, join everyone on such an auspicious occasion. Um, the title of my talk this afternoon is Reclaiming Tongues, and uh, the rest of it is what translation taught me about cultural competence when the dominant culture is not enough. Now, mostly I'm going to share my personal experience doing translation work among law communities in northern Uganda, and especially among people who came from uh, oral cultures. And because, that's because Uganda has a really huge refugee community, and all those communities have stories that they come with them when they've lost everything that they attached to their identity, the stories always remain. And these stories are not merely stories people tell each other, but the kind of the intangible heritage of a people who hang on to their folk tales, to their traditional uh, namings for children or for people as a way of remaining and being competent in their humanness when everything seems to be fragile. So I curate what is called Deo African, and uh, Deo African started as a means of changing the narrative around storytelling, because I was tired of the, what many people call poverty porn, I mean, it was the stock images of going online and seeing the starving child with the flies. I said, no, we don't want this anymore. 
but we don't have the huge resources. What can we do about this? The simple thing is start with what you have. So we've got a reading group. It brings together lots of uh, people who are interested in writing. And these are the literati of Kampala. And w this is just friends meeting, just like the Jalada people, and coming up and saying, we're going to publish these, produce stories, and then we're going to look for opportunities to have our short stories or poetry read at fora outside of the country. And that is how Day African started. Now, the story of Day African was actually much more critical around 2012 when the Joseph Kohn, I think, uh, when Invisible Children had that viral campaign. It was all over the news. But when I went back to the camps and to the communities who had left the IDP camps <coughs> to actually speak to people and understand from what perspective the people telling us the story of coin versus the people who had lived that experience, it was actually quite a disjuncture and for those who had lived out the war and who knew that even despite all these hardships, they still had their folk tales. It was another betrayal in the sense that it created a huge narrative around a post-conflict society that was trying to heal and tried to frame the narrative as a community that is beholden to imperial interests to try to see themselves come out of war again. So, Personally, what I've been doing is trans translating simple folk tales. And what I learned that as a person who came from the city and with privileges, I could just not enter into a, pro into a deprived community and tell them, hey, tell me your story, and I'm going to translate it in this way. There's a way I had to approach the people. There's a way I had to humble myself and come to their level of understanding. There's a way I had to leave my educated self back in the academy or back in the university and try. As There's a way I had to be culturally aware of the struggles of the community before trying to put my own meanings into what they were saying. And also because I was speaking to old ladies who in the old days used to sit around a fireside, what was called a wang o, now, the Wang O is the place whereby all intergenerational knowledge creation happened and what the where the dissemination of knowledge took place. So you have the elderly and the young. And those are time I was in a place called Paibona. Paibona is, no is in northern Uganda. And I was with a family, and there was an elderly granny who came from a place called Madiope. Madiope is near the border between Uganda and South Sudan. But because of the fluidity of uh, borders and boundaries, she had married inside Paibona. So she was telling me a folk tale about lightning and thunder. And then she used the word dea. Now, in uh, a trolley from uh, Eastern Uganda, we don't say dea, we say um, the word for thunder is different. It's, uh, it's another word anyway. It's escaped me now. But the importance about that was the old people had their register, and the young people also had their register. And whereas this story was about thunder and lightning, when a young person told it, I heard the same story told by a little boy who told me the elephant had a gun, and then he shot lightning and thunder into the sky. So it showed me that the language had evolved and the culture that was carried in lightning and thunder was just no longer about the sky. But it was also about the people coming out of conflict. And, no, and the evolution in storytelling meant that the language was a living thing. And when the old elderly people passed away, there was going to be a new memory, a new memory of gun battles and lightning and thunder no longer being something in the sky, but something manufactured. 
So that profoundly affected the way I saw translation and it took me back to the past. And for us, the past was the golden age of the 1960s and the Makere conference, the 1962 conference, which was essentially about African literatures in English expression. Now, we've already heard Wale Shoyinka speak about how amazing the conference was, but what was also not talked about was the profound psychic effect and physical effect that that conference ha had on the people who attended it. For instance, when we talk about the suits, that obviously is a smart way of being relevant and being respectful. And the culture of the conference, of course, entailed that people dress up nicely. But a couple of years later, Okot Bitek, who was, I think he's, uh, he's up there, at the right cheek of Rajat Yogi, who's just up on the picture. So Okot Bitek wrote a seminal essay, the title of which was Africa's Cultural Revolution. And inside Africa's Revolution, there's a quote that says, um, it, it decries apemanship, or reproduction of knowledge without essentially having a critical look into what makes that knowledge relevant in Europe and how when it comes to the ground in Uganda at that time, it was different and how applicable was it? it was. So for instance, we're now aware that Many of the people who attended the conference changed their names or they gave back their European sounding names. And what one had to ask was, why was that? Why did James Ngugi become Ngugi Wationgo? It meant something. And so the important thing about what the men and women who came to the conference did was to find a means of the different ethnicities and languages and nationalities, find, have a way of finding community and talking to each other. But yet, for a young person like me, a person who has grown up in many countries, I still have Ugandan roots, and I look at Uganda today, and I'm afraid I do not want to talk about the negative aspects, but I'd like to talk about the positive aspects that bring us together. And for us, it's the digital era. The important things to us is, for instance, you know, global anti-blackness. How does it manifest when we leave Africa and go and live in Europe? You know? If Black Lives Matter happens in the United States, of course, a young little man lost his life to pol police brutality. And if we go online and we still go, and then there's still a Chinese museum exposition that shows Africans' faces next to the faces of animals, or if we look into the academy and the prevailing conversation around how we translate our cultures into meaningful expressions of our humanity is still, you know, the erasure and invisibility of knowledge systems from people of African heritage. It still means the roads must fall campaign is still very valid for us. But also it means things like, why is my curriculum white is still very valid for us because these are ways for us to reclaim our heritage. And our heritage includes the languages of our ancestors. And my talk was a bit longer, but I'd like to talk about, you know, to conclude by, you know, thinking about digital humanities because what, Richard Odor Oduko said was incredibly important. The fact that this is, you know, this is the era of social media, of Instagram, Facebook, and Snapchat. When anything happens online, it, there's a swift movement, and retribution is vicious. But it also allows us to come together and have conversations. So those of us who still value oralities, we are still looking at how, even on Facebook and Instagram, sometimes it's those small audio-visual 
elements that make being online quite attractive to all of us. And uh, when we think about you know, how translation for us matters, you know, I'd just like to think, to, for us to think about um, Jordan Peele's new film. And um, if you see this, the, this is the fear issue of the collaboration between Jalada and Transition. Now, Transition is the magazine that Rajat Diyogi initiated in Kampala. But Jalada is, was done by, the, is, is an African collective. But when, when you see how Jordan Peele's, Peele's film, Get Out, I wonder how many of you have watched Get Out? Now, yes, you recall that there's a Swahili song and it's not translated. Mm -hmm. And you know, when, uh, when the protagonist is running through the forest, you know, you hear this, all these sounds and they're singing and it's ominous and it's being done in Swahili. It means it's bringing, you know, disparate aspects of the ancestral voices that kind of still live in the southern tradition of uh, ghost stories or, you know, haunted memories, the kind that Toni Morrison speaks about in Beloved, you know, the kind of singing and tales and stories of haunting. So it, it's, it all comes together really beautifully and um, to close, ca cap it all up, I'm just saying that sometimes translation is great but it has to be meaningful before we enter in, into any society and try to translate. It's important that we understand the cultural context of a people. We have to insert ourselves among them in such humility as to make, to make us a part of the people we live with. And to cap it up, digital humanities is great, but also the dangers of artificial intelligence is it only replicates human knowledge. Thus, I think when we're going to use the tools of computing, for instance, to translate, for instance, there's a the, the, the word for water in Japanese is omizu, and in Luganda it's amazi. So it's like when you try to translate that and you find the affinities between the languages, I mean, it makes us capable of, of influencing anthropology, of finding the, root, the roots of words. And I think it's important that more Africans and Africanists engage with uh, with computing to ensure that for the extended global heritage, African languages actually continue being important and the dissemination of knowledge continues in the great tradition of keeping our cultures alive because languages are living things. If children are going to tell stories that have changed drastically from what their ancestors' stories were, then all these changes have to be captured in a way that entails that one day, when we're not here, some aliens might look at our records and say, yes, this was a beautiful moment in humanity. Thank you. So our next speaker is Kwajo Senyame, who is a lecturer in African literature at SOAS. First of all, thank you very much, uh, my panel members, for accommodating me and smuggling me in last minute. I'm, uh, I'm going to try and use my full 15 minutes and hope, hope that I don't have to beg for another five minutes to complete. My title is Translating Africa in Literature, Culture, and History, Reflections, Past, Present, and Future. There is no doubt at this point in historical time that writers from Africa and of African descent, to speak especially perhaps of the best and the most canonized, have established a creative tradition in European languages, English, French, Spanish, German, Portuguese, etc that has primed the consciousness of the world to the most important events and occurrences within African existence. The critique of Arab and European slavery in Ike 1973 novel, 2000 Seasons, and in Amar Tedu's twin plays, The Dialogue of a Ghost and Anoa, 1970-1965, Tony Morrison's classic novel of Afri African-American slavery, American slavery in Beloved, 1987, The Affirmation of African Narratives of Reclamation in Chuna Achebe's Things Fall Apart, 1958, and in Gugi Wathiongo's Weep Not Child, 1964, and The River Between, 1965, the novels of Rural Igoland by Flora and Wapa, Ifuru 1966 and Idu 1970. The 1980 Noma Award winning So Long a Letter by Senegalese Mariam Abba. The classic African autobiographical novel by Wole Shoinka Ake, 
the years of childhood, 1981, a narrative classified together with Sheikh Hamid, Hamidu Khan's ambiguous adventure, 1961, and in more recent times, Titi Dangaramba's no, no, novel, Nervous Conditions, as among the very best of stories of growing up and self-formation, conventionally referred to as the bonus roman in world fiction. With Shoinka's Ake standing taller simply by virtue of being more lengthy, detailed, and comprehensive in its portrayal of African familial life at one of the most important points of contact with Western culture and civilization. Novels addressing questions of nationhood and nationalism, such as Chinua Achebe is a Man of the People, 1966, Aiko Yama's The Beautiful Ones Are Not Yet Born, 1968, and Fragments, 1969, Ngugi Wathiongo's Petals of Blood of 1977, and his 1980 Devil on the Cross, narratives such as Bessie Head's A Question of Power, 1973, and Buche Mechete's The Joys of Motherhood, Examining Gender and Power Relations Within Africa. These and many more texts, the list goes on and on infinitely, have illuminated our understanding of Africa and African lives. All of the above mentioned accounts of Africa have attained the status of masterpieces within African fiction and contributed immensely in helping Africans define and shape our destiny. Today, even as we somewhat collectively journey towards an uncertain future, there remain important fictional historical works that form part of that essential intellectual and ideological toolkit that has been central in helping us come to terms with the cacophony of experiences within contemporary African existence. Some of these works have been central in affirming and legitimating us as historical subjects who were not and never shall be barbaric others to other civilized selves, and have proven that we were not living in a state of primitivism and savagery before Europeans ventured into colonizing us, a fact established even earlier, much earlier, with the heavy Af African philosophical disquis disquisitional positions articulated as far back as Kisley Hayford's Ethiopia and Bound of 1911, and saw Plaquet's Moody, published in 1930. These are both examples of narratives that began the project of African self-reclamation and Renaissance way before even Chinua Achebe's celebrated definitive text of African liberation, things fall apart. Despite the monumental achievement of the existing body of works within African literatures, which have robustly resisted any attempt to marginalize us within history, we face other enormous tasks in our attempts at developing our thought and visions for the future for a multiplicity of reasons. Today, in the here and now, Africans both within the continent and in the extended homelands of the New World, Caribbean, and other diasporas face a lot of challenges. We face extreme political right-wingism from the West in Europe and in the Americas, xenophobia, blatant, overt, and undisguised anti-African racism, a vitriolic and acerbic anti-immigrant culture and attitude which we black folk often seem to suffer from most, or at least so we feel. Remember, she who feels it knows it. In the, uh, America, the ultra-conservatives have re-emerged who have historical affiliations with the Ku Klux Klan in the form of a hydra-headed dragon beast of a leader. Media images continually show Africans being washed ashore the Mediterranean as they seek to flee the colonial and neo-colonially induced poverty, poverty and economic hardship triggered in the first instance by the encounter with European adventures, pirates, conquistadors, pillagers, and plunderers. It matters not really that much of this economic dispossession is now superintended by a bunch of small-minded and highly ideologically unprogressive characters masquerading as our leaders. There's such palpably deep hatred for Africans and people of African descent today. With their hostile mindset, which seeks to continually reinforce the high barriers and walls of Fortress Europe and Great White Americana, the policymakers and overlords of these would have been host nations who order that African victims of economic dispossession be put in body bags and sometimes dumped back into the sea to be food for the whales and sharks and other predator fishes, forget a fundamental principle of logic and life articulated in the Igbo proverb, if you bring ant-infested maggots into your house, you must expect the visit of lizards. Slavery and colonialism came and visited us. Otherwise, we were sitting out somewhere, drinking tasty palm wine under the hot and pleasurable African sun, after having worked long, hard, and productive hours on our farms, and eating a nice meal of plantain and spinach. We did not know the route to Fortress Europe and Great White Americana until the David Livingstons and Mongo Parks and Christopher Columbuses and the Sir Francis Drakes and Long John Silvers and all them bloody imperialists and colonizers decided to visit us either on the continent proper or in our Caribbean and New World homelands. What we have learned from our history and from our encounter with the West is that we are not congenitally poor, we are not a naturally underdeveloped people. The sense of doom and gloom engendered in the Western media about Africans as perpetual economic scavengers requiring aid and charity from the West needs to be challenged and exposed for the glaring falsities and contradictions, for this is the dominant mode of thought even in Western academic curricula. It is the ideological fulcrum around which certain courses in anthropology or economics or development studies or history operate in certain universities. <laughs> the, the institutional mechanisms and epistemolog epistemological base of Western scholarship validates and legitimates this view of an African Af of Africa endlessly needing aid or charity. When students of African descent with a different experience of the 
of life question this posture, they often fall in trouble with their teachers and lecturers. And particularly when it happens to be the case, as it really is, for example, that Africa and Africans are blessed with some of the wealthiest of the world's resources, but still suffer mass social deprivation and the deepest and most shameful forms of economic stagnation. We are made to believe, especially seeing the perilous journeys we are undertaking across the Atlantic to enter Europe and Americana, that we are natural beggars, always in want of somebody else's assistance. This dominant mode of thought, portrayed consistently with sheer abandon and with flagrant delight by Western media, is the same dominant of formulaic approach to knowledge production within much of Western academy. It's precisely this manner of thinking that bifurcated Westerners into superior, superordinate humans and Africans into the West evolutionary inferior, as presented, for example, in that infamous Polish descent English writer, Joseph Conrad's Heart of Darkness. And it is this which led to the memorable rebuttal essay by Chino Achebe, An Image of Africa, Racism in Conrad's Heart of Darkness. This is the very same ideological approach and code which couched in the metropole versus peri periphery binary discourse seeks to lo locate Africa as an eternal child of on the evolutionary scale of human growth as perpetually underdeveloped. What we need to question though is what kind of phenomenon within nature never passes the stage of infancy, teenagehood, youthhood, and never matures into adulthood and old age. I cannot identify any single living organism or phenomenon that does not undergo this life cycle. Yet Africa is perennially moored to a state of infancy and underdevelopment. We should not succumb to this epistemological motif of a primordial Africa as a continent of backward and degenerate people. This is a myth created by a recycled and to be perpetrated by Europe to suit its own exploitative purposes. For while the West will point out to you that Africans are being brutalized and dispossessed in this day and age by their own Yoweri Museveni's, by their own Denis Sassoon Quesos, and by their own Paul B.S., to mention only a few, they will not admit to you that these butchers and murderers and nation dispossessors are indeed propped up by the, in the same manner as the West did the Sania Bachas, the Jean Badul Bukasas, the Mobutu Sesekos, and the Hastings Kamudu Bandas of years back. Some easy questions to ask to prove the point are, when these people masquerading as our leaders loot and fleece us of our wealth, where do they keep their illegally acquired booty? In which banks are the billions of Naira $10 and the billions of CDs $10 pounds and euros etc. stolen from Africa kept? Which economy benefits from these huge fraudulently deposited amounts? Whose population gets to have the money and the large chunk of cash for all manner of developmental projects? These questions must be answered before anyone attempts to portray corruption as an innate and naturally inherited African trait. Even if inherited, then we should know by now also where from, shouldn't we? It is crucial to know that, though, that in spite of um, Africa's present condition and all it has suffered via colonialism, slavery, and neocolonialism, we still look up to a radiant new dawn. Of course, we have many an angst, many a crisis of identity that we are going through. No doubt our situation is very complicated and complex, for even as I've been talking about Africa in a homogeneous, unified sense, we are made up of a multiplicity of ethnicities and languages and cultures. Many of us combine a myriad of tongues and are multilingual, nomadic world travelers and world citizens and denizens of planet Mother Earth. And especially by virtue of our process of becoming largely through Western colonial education, we are, as Abna Buzia oppositely puts it, in her poem, All My Friends Are Exiles. We are all exiles who, though born in one, we are, some of us are exiles who, though born in one place, live in another. Buzia adds in a poem that, with the globe at our command, we have everywhere to go but home. Viewing it from this angle, it is not so easy to lump together Africa as a unified continent or peoples with a common sense of home. While this may be true, we must reaffirm and re-engage with the metaphor of home and indeed homelessness that Buzia deploys in a very rigorous manner ideologically and link it to the transfigurative and transformative power of the new radiant dawn that we must envision for Africa, both continentally and in the diaspora and homelands. We must not forget, for example, that our ongoing struggle against xenophobia, against anti-immigrant attitudes and sentiments is very consequent on the fact that empire and uh, the empire and the commonwealth is using all surreptitious manner of means to question the validity of our presence in the West, here in the diaspora, despite Western powers, of course, having freely roamed the globe and the earth at a point in time and gone everywhere and taken everything that belonged to others and kept it for themselves. If you perchance doubt, doubt what I'm saying, just visit the British Museum, which is just five minutes' walk from here, and see who owns, um, um, how, who owns what and how come someone owns everything that is for several other people. How did that happen and how did that come about? Lord have mercy upon our souls. <laughs> British Museum, out of here, ten right. Ten right. <laughs> you, get, you get to the British Museum. Okay. In the face of the ongoing assault on Africans and people of African descent, we need a fuller understanding of the contradictions underpinning our contemporary global existence. We need a better understanding of the paradoxes that inform our journeys. The multilingual, multi-ethnic, intercultural identity that we have is still very much the forte of our resistance to this onslaught. And this is particularly because the assault on us is one which very much questions the very validity of our identities, of our very existence, just as it did from the moment when the first enslaved African set foot in the Americas and in the Western Hemisphere. Valuing, retrieving, and treasuring and protecting that identity is an essential part of our struggle for self-esteem team and for our collective and indi individual freedoms. Indeed, the perpetuation of our existence devolves on our very ability to self-define and self-articulate the world we want to live in, in our, on our own terms. 
In this reimagining of our African future, language and culture will play a central part. On home soil, consequently, it should be less about laughter, locally acquired foreign accents, and more about immersion in our indigenous languages and cultures with a view to deriving maximum benefit from the deep philosophical worldviews inherent in our numerous languages and cultures. It should be less about interpreting and translating Mexican and Spanish telenovelas and soap operas into our local languages, and more about reproducing and disseminating our own indigenous art forms. Language signals and equals culture, and culture signals and equals language. In the diaspora too, it should be less about us embracing a trumped up but vacuous multicultural diversity that is all political talk and rhetoric, and which in any case visibly contradicts the xenophobic and anti-African discourses emerging and seeping out of the same political tack. For us, it should be more about the fidelity to the language and culture of our original homelands. It should be less, so to speak, about the self-alienation of us from our African heritage. Let me share a brilliant poem by Cape Verdean poet Louis Andrade Silva titled The Emigrant Son that illustrates the point I am making. The Emigrant Son, that thin little boy bundled up to protect himself from the rain and snow, black smock, frail body, moth-eating beret pulled over his head and hands in his pockets. He's an immigrant. He speaks French. He knows the history of Napoleon. His, he reads Sartre and Tehad de Chardin. Nevertheless, he would like to know something of his country. Each day, he must face the racism of his schoolmates and ask himself why he must live in this country. His parents, exhausted from hard daily struggle, deflect his questions with a simple look of sadness. They hope to return home next year on holiday, and do so they must work 16, and to do so they must work 16 hours a day. If God wills, he'll go too, if only his thin little body can survive winter, racism, and other miseries. Within the constraints of the predominant cultures of French or English or Portuguese or Spanish or Italian or whatever we find ourselves and our kith and kin associated with, we must not deflect the pertinent questions about our existence with a simple look of sadness. Otherwise, conventionally, as is the case of the emigrant son, the children's interest in their heritage and culture wane. The desire to explore the world of their heritage is sometimes frustrated by the harsh economic and social realities of daily existence that their parents are confronted with. Of course, this is not a scenario in every single case of migrant life abroad. The point being made is that the undesirable migrants and migrant children who may be victims of xenophobia even in a society that appears to have accepted them, should be equipped with alternative worlds and worldviews as part of their rites of passage into an increasingly hostile and uncertain world. It is imperative that they know some language, some culture, some home that they and we all can fall back on and where we will be received and warmly embraced. In Dambuja Maracheras 22, 35, I've done 11, how many minutes have I done? Um, I started at 22 and I'm on 35. You still have one more minute? 12. But, you know, if, if, if you breathe, I'll give you two. <laughs> okay. In, in Dambujo Maracheras' po polemical novel of 1979, The House of Anger, the young protagonist comes home from the colonial school one day speaking to his mother. I remember coming home one day, running with glee. I forget what it was I was happy about, and though it was a rather dismal day, I was on heat with living. I burst into the room and all at once exploded into my story, telling it restlessly and with expansive gestures, telling it to mother who was staring. A stinging slap had made my, that made my ears sing, stop me. I stared up at mother in confusion. She hit me again. How dare you speak to me in English? She, she said crossly, you know I don't understand it. And if you think because you're educated, I'm not speaking in English. I began, but stopped as I suddenly realized that I was talking to her in English. I rushed out of the room, I jumped and rushed back into the room, and dragging my box from under the bed, took out my English exercise books and began to tear them up with a great childish violence. Mother watched me in silence. What we witnessed in the passage above, especially the anger that the young protagonist's mother expresses through her visitation of physical violence on her poor innocent child is simply a protective cry for Mother Africa. Her actions are against the background of the turbulent violence imposed on Zimbabwe society by white settler colonialism, an invading culture of conquest and subjugation that has not only stolen her land and her people, but is now stealing her own child from her. Her anger and rage, futilely rooted through her slapping of her son, is actually directed at white colonialism and imperial racism. It is a white man who has invaded her land, taken her land, and seeks to institute a rapture with the African family. Her particular understanding of the colonial experience is shared by other African mothers. Okay, I guess my time is up. Um, but I could finish in five minutes. Mm, mm, but is, is my time up? Uh, if, if my time up, this is a good enough conclusion. But it, if you it, give it me is another up. five minutes, I'll finish. Is, this, it is, is, up, is yes. time up? Yes. Okay, right, fine. <laughs> And last but not least, Wangui Wangoro. Thank you so much. I'm still trying to breathe for Kojo. <laughs> uh, it's a great pleasure for me to be here. Let me um, get into this. Has my minute gone? <laughs> OK. 
Okay, there we are. And I'm really honored to be here. I believe it's a historic and historical event, like that one. And uh, I just like, by a show of hands, to know how many translators are here. Don't be shy. Translators, stand up and be seen. Let's celebrate us, please. Thank you. Um, much of what I wanted to say has been said, so if my paper's disjointed, uh, do forgive me. It's just a joy to be with this very wonderful panel and for us to be able to hear us ourselves. It's very rare and we're very proud to have been offered this very large panel. I also want to acknowledge the publishers of translation. Can you show your hands? Don't be shy. Ayebia, where are you? At Khadija, Margaret. Ayebia is not here. James. Yeah, yeah. Oh, there you are. Good. And good. And Shaggy, of course. Yes. So I think we are moving forward. And Jalada, you didn't put up your hands. Jalada here. And we must celebrate them as the new babies on the translation uh, circus. But we're very proud of them. They are strong and exciting baby. Um, so my talk was supposed to be about translation, African knowledge, and African knowledge futures. And I also wanted to go back to this 1962 conference. Uh, I think it was framed to be of African literature in English language. And it was held, as you know, in 1962. And I think it was officially called the Conference of African Writers of English Expression. So here for me is the starting point of my talk that it was for Anglophone speakers. And if you look at who was there, Chebe Walishoinka, John Clark, Obiwali, Lekara, etc., you will see mainly that they are from the English speaking Anglophone world um, indeed. So, in terms of the African project, in terms of the period, it was 1962 when most countries were preparing for independence, and of course, the big Pan African um, Unity Conference was going to happen, and the African U Organization of African Unity was going to be formed in 1960. In, in the following year, but it is quite striking that the African writers, African writers were meeting without their counterparts, the Clusophone, if we can call it that, Afrophone, <coughs> Arabophone, and Hispanic phone, in fact, uh, and all the African 2000 plus languages as we know um, of, of them today. Uh, what has struck me as really exciting is to have living people who can actually tell us what happened here, as well as us trying to discover what happened. We could have asked Shoinka here what exactly happened, rather than guessing. And there are a large number of those people are still living, and I hope that this conference triggers us to go and actually talk to them and ask them who was there, as you saw with the photo. He couldn't remember who it was, and we'll hope to hear a little bit about that uh, soon. But it's a great honor to have a continuity in living people like Professor Shoinka. And in my own case, as you know, I've had interactions with Professor Gugi Thiongo for a long time. And they talk about this moment as a moment of great importance to them. It brought them together and it started a conversation that we in the African, in the Anglophone world, of course, cherish and value very much with all its contradictions. And I believe that there are many contradictions, as you heard here today but I won't go into them at all. But um, most of my observations are drawn from my own experiences, um, and some of them are of us, a number of us here, who are direct and indirect products of such a conference. If I can say, in my own case, this conference influenced the change of curriculum of the English department in, at the Nairobi University of which then I'm subsequently a product of where the curriculum changed from being an Anglophone, European phone, English phone uh, curriculum, and it focused more on African literary traditions, and some of those writers like Shoinka, Professor Shoinka, etc., became part of the curriculum that I studied, so I don't have those tensions that others may have, but we grew up reading Achebe and so forth and so on, and I'm sure Professor Palive would attest to this, that. It, it was an important moment for us and, and Ayebia and others who are probably my generation. And it went on to influence other developments that have happened in world literary history as a result. So although there's a lot that one could say is that 
I believe that the conference has gone on to produce great writers of those who were present, but it has also shaped the African literary canon because of the press, the importance of the English language in the world. And also we must remember at this time that the Commonwealth writers were quite united in what they were doing. So this literature was sitting globally alongside other literatures of Asian, uh, Caribbean, and so forth and so on. So the transnational nature of these writers is also very important. And we heard about the Negritude movement, but we must also remember this Commonwealth movement and its importance for Southern peoples. So the, the North, South, and there's also the, the, the uh, lateral movements. And it has continued to fire our imagination, our scholarship, our productivity in publishing and publications and literary engagement through criticism, evaluation, and writing. And this is just a microcosm of what goes on every day in some of our lives. As you know, there's an African Literature Association which is existent and some of us are part of that. So this is part of our daily diet. And for those who are not aware, that there are places where African literature is being discussed all the time in Africa, in the North and so forth and so on. And it's important to be part of those ongoing conversations as was spoken about the importance of conferences. But I think that the Makere Conference was framed by wider political, cultural, and economic context of decolonization from colonial rule, and therefore it was itself an artifact of what I would call future, which we are still living today. And I think it's a long moment, if we take it from that moment, I still think we're in that moment of framing future. And it's not a simple one, but I think in retrospect, and we will come to see um, that it we can try and unpack, as we are trying to do in this conference, the con complex contradictions of that period of time. Like we heard about funding, who holds these conferences, why are they being held? There's a sign here saying 100 years of SOAS. Why are we not at Nairobi? Why are not we not at Makere? Why are we not um, in Johannesburg? But we are thankful to be here, obviously. Uh, these are some of the contradictions. So, um, as I said, that there is an absence of the Lusophone, Afrophone, the 2,000 African languages, the Francophone literature, and the Arabic literature, not to, not to mention the Egyptian hieroglyphics, the Timbuktu texts, the Ethiopian texts, etc., etc. that we only frame these moments in the colonial moment, but African writing and literature goes way back, and definitely we don't have a presence of African texts um, in being discussed at this time. And the question does come, and I think it was Obi Wali who at that conference raised the question of what is African literature, which is at the heart of what I want to speak today. And I think it's still a question that we can still debate. And for me, that's for what focused me to my work on translation, that question. Is it literature in European languages, or is it literature in, um, in European languages about Africa. And I think Kalive has addressed this question about uh, authenticity, so I won't go into it, but I think it is a complex question that we should pay attention to within the decolonizing frame against which we must place it. Um, so it's not just a moment of translation, it's a specific moment in time where we are talking about decolonizing Africa. And then many theories have come about since then, about post-colonial theory, decolonial theory, colonial theory, and so forth and so on. So we must see translation and this particular meeting within this context as part of a long historical frame, which we're still uh, 55 years. It's not a very long time in cultural history. I also wanted to talk to you a little bit about my own involvement in translation as part of translation history, as I do embody it. Um, and to say that while Gugi was having his big moment of epiphany of writing in African languages in Kenya, I was here at university trying to learn to be a translator. And one of the requirements was that we must learn to speak in our mother tongues. And of course, I was supposed to offer English as my mother tongue. And you can imagine psychologically this impact and the trauma this had on me because English clearly is not my mother tongue, nor is it even my second language. It's probably my third language as I grew up hearing and learning Kiswahili all my life. 
until I was three, four, is when I started encountering English. So I was emotionally bothered by this lack of mother tongue. So it was very fortunate that Gugi was having this epiphany moment because it created immediate work for me because when I left university, I went to Henry Chakava and he allowed me to translate Gugi's uh, children's stories at the age of 23 and it did change my life. We're talking now, um, for those who actually want to know my age, <laughs> I've nearly given myself away, but that's a long time ago. Let's just say, <laughs> just, let's just say about 30, 30 or so years. If you add 23, then you'll get a number. But <laughs> so it's a long time ago. The translation has been happening at least embodied by me for a long time, and I know that there are many other translators, Shoinka himself, uh, Professor Irele, who we'll hear about, and many other people have been translating African literature, and you'll see on the Heinemann uh, Reader series, which I think James published, you'll see that there was already a tradition of publishing uh, um, African languages, at least across uh, European, uh, those literatures, at least across the European languages, you could read Francophone literature in English, um, not so much into the French language and so on, but English did do its best, despite the marginal position of African literature in the world canon, which we tried to address with the 100 best books um, of the 20th century, which is a project I could talk about and how hard we fought to put African language books on that list, how hard we even tried to find them, but in the end you'll see it's the old canon of um, that was predominant, and you'll see it's the English language canon that was even in that hundred books of the 20th century, you'll see that it's the, the English books that were predominant, and probably books by men, I could say that as well. So um, my own experience, of course, was starting from nowhere, because in Kenya it's not the tradition that we weren't taught our languages in schools, but I was brave, because I had to be and it gave me a sense of purpose and it shifted my own positioning around how literature and where literature should be positioned. And I'll just rush and say that the main question for me at this conference is what is the location of African literature, which is not a question I have asked, but it's a question that was asked by Homi Baba in his seminal text, The Location of Culture. And I think that is one of the issues that we're trying to address today, where is it situated in the wider scheme of things, in the wider scheme of power, and where are the individuals, and I think again this is not something I'm raising, but Carol Boyce Davis has theorized it in her book of the same year, um, the, and she, where she raises the issue of the location of the subject. So um, I think the question of gate, gatekeepers has been raised and who pays, and who pays the piper? Who pays the piper, what's the expression? So I think you can answer that for yourself, and I think in that whole question of positioning, we have not yet arrived at independence, but I think we are on the way there. But it has its complexities, but I won't go into those. But I can share with you some theoretical issues that I've come across. Um, that I want you to think about. Uh, they're theoretical issues and they're very big, but I'll just mention them. I like talking about them, and I think you've heard on, around the Somali question about this question of translatability and the importance of context of translation and who you're translating for, what's your purpose, and who is your, who's paying you. And we've seen that Africa has been the play place play of global politics, whether it's terrorism, as Professor talked this morning, whether it's the Cold War, whether it's the resource war, whether it's the whatever it is, it is the site of, of contestation, and we cannot deny that. So what, who, who, what is the translation, what is the equivalence of a word in Somali or in, 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 in Tigrinya? and how do we understand it in the European frame. I think somebody talked about how images of Africa are projected. I think those images um, also influence the, the words that are used to understand a context. I also believe firmly that there are limits of translation. It's something for a long time, as a theorist, I didn't want to contemplate. I always, for a long time, argued everything is translatable 
but I think at the psychic and emotional level, not everything yet is translatable. And I use the word yet guardedly. I hope, of course, the utopia of equivalence will one day arrive, but I think we are quite a far away, we are quite far away from that point. I also think that the terrain is ever shifting, and I'd like to just refer to the great moment of fake news that we are living through now. I don't think it's very new, but it's very amplified now that public policy is being declared as fake news and that people are claiming fake news daily. And I think this fakeness is impacting on our learning environment and it's also impacting the publishing environment and it's also inevitably going to impact on the translation environment. As many of you know, translators have been killed for their work and I'd like just to mention that uh, one well-known translator was killed, was a Japanese translator. He translated Salman Rushdie's Satanic Verses. So the, there are limits to translation. And then the question that arises is, do we censor ourselves or do we leave those texts to some other safe time in the future? And what is the impact of the ethics of reality today? Um, I will move to another issue, is that I went recently to Ghana to a conference on African Studies Association of Africa. And I'm raising this as a concern because it's only now that an African Studies Association of Africa has actually been launched in Africa. Well, we're heading for the 50th or 60th, I think 60th anniversary of African Studies Association in the United States you would want to ask yourself, why has it taken so long to have an African Studies Association in Africa itself? There are many arguments, which I will not go into, such as that everyday scholarship in Africa is African Studies, but I think this is the first time a formal body has been formed, and it was talking about some of these issues, and one of the issues that I walked away with in terms of my own work is the whole question of commensurability, which again, I won't go into, into detail, but it's again to do with the standards and the measures of translation and its limits and its compatibility and its desirability. In my own personal practice, after that moment of epiphany, a lot of people used to say you couldn't translate African language literatures into European languages, which of course now we've proved, as you heard with this story. Oh, one minute? Uh, zero. Zero minute. <laughs> As you heard with Jalada, they have 40, 70 stories in African languages, which blows the idea that it's not possible to translate in African languages. But I do want to say there are many institutions now. We run Sidensi here in London. Africa Rights holds a session called Africa in Translation. We have African Literature Association has tr translation caucus of the African Study Literature Association. I run an institution called Sidensi, and I wanted to show you some books which are at the table. Here, I think, um, this work going in and out of African languages now. So I don't think it's new, and it's growing. It's coming to an exploding moment, and I think it's a wonderful time. And I, for a, an old practitioner, I'm very excited that we are growing and we want you to join us and to support us and <coughs> to buy our books and to review the translations. It's very important for you to review the translations, not just saying it's a good translation, but to say why. Look at the original and look at the final text and tell us why it's a good translation. So far people just translate, read the English or French and say it's a good translation and it not may, may be, not be the truth, but I'm celebrating, and I'm very happy that you're here. Thank you very much. Finally, we have our discussant, Dr. Shegegi Theora, who also uh, teaches at SOAS, um, and he also teaches translation, so I believe we will have a very um, good summary and discussion of the uh, papers. Thank you very much. Um, I now have the, uh, the task of uh, sort of summarizing briefly and also maybe try and look for a bit of thread through 
uh, the very brilliant uh, talks that we've had this afternoon about this very, very live topic of uh, translation. Uh, we started out with uh, Odor and uh, his discussion, his uh, bringing us to date, up to date on uh, Jalada, this online mag uh, journal. And um, here, the main point is about the importance of machine translation, which I think he correctly pointed out as uh, a very important tool, uh, not only for breaking barriers between language and cultures, I would add it's a, a, a machine, machine translation is a very important for democratization. Uh, it is really critical that in a situation of Africa where most countries, most populations are multilingual, that access to knowledge, information, and other things is made possible through translation. And obviously, the most feasible means is having these machines that can actually do the job really, really quickly. About the, the, the question of, uh, uh, of, of just how much machines can do with uh, culture, and uh, other pragmatic issues related to translation, that remains to be seen. I believe there's still a long way to go before machines can actually mirror the human mind exactly as it is and incorporate all elements of culture and so forth. I mean, we keep getting very interesting updates uh, about the advances, particularly in places like Japan, uh, about artificial intelligence and the extent to which uh, uh, doubles, people are making actually doubles that can mimic the whole human, uh, 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 all registers of talk. But I think that's a much broader topic. I think the key thing here is that artificial intelligence, machine translation can enable conversation among many, many languages. Of course, the question of the hierarchy of languages remains. Now, it's very impressive to, us to hear that we have 70 languages. Uh, this story has been translated into 70 languages. But which of these languages? Why the 70 languages out of the 2,200 that we have in Africa? That is a question that we have to obviously uh, uh, deal with about the hierarchy of languages and the choices that we have to make. Uh, we moved on to a very, very uh, wonderful presentation by my colleague Martin Orwin about Somali poetry. Uh, Martin, it is very clear, has been working intensively and with great passion on this topic of uh, Somali language as we know from his uh, today's presentation as well as other past presentations and publications. And I think the key point here I understood was the responsibility of the translator to the translation, to the language, to the culture, to the people behind that language. And I think it seems like a responsibility that uh, Martin takes very, very uh, seriously. And I think all translators certainly would have this burden upon them. It is up to us, actually, it's actually a very, very big burden to try to live up to all those uh, standards that have been mentioned. And of course, the difficulties of translation, right? Um, in particular, and not exclusively to African languages, but translating the music, the alliteration, the rhythm of the Somali language or any other language for the matter, it is really, really difficult. <clears throat> and also, and therefore, uh, these are very, very hard to capture, as, he put it, as Martin put it himself, simple but profound messages are very, very, can be very, very difficult to translate. It may seem very simple in the language that of the, of, of the, of the, of the uh, source language, but actually translating it can be much more problematic than it may seem on the surface, and therefore omissions, additions, I believe these are things that all of us translators have to contend with. We constantly have to change and, you know, add or omit, or et cetera, et cetera, which, um, uh, is meant to ensure the, f the flow uh, of the language and the power, so, and so that the power of the language can come through. We moved on and discussed, we heard more from Sophie about uh, uh, the key point here I understood was the need for cultural competence. And I think that ties in very well with what uh, the other speakers have talked about, that it is impossible to be a good translator without having a full competence in both cultures of the source language and the target language. This is something we all know, but sometimes we take it very lightly. We take it as if, well, I know the language, and therefore it's easy for, well, I can transfer the meaning from X language to Y language. But beyond that, there are lots of other nuances that I think every translator must be conscious about, and not just being conscious of them, but actually be competent in them in order to deliver a proper good translation. And so in translating uh, Luo, uh, Luo, uh, Ugandan Luo uh, uh, oral, oral literature, the other key thing that she raised uh, that comes out of that 
is how to translate oral literature. You know? Translating orality is also another challenge. Why? Mainly because we have all these other paralinguistic features, or rather extra-linguistic features, which have to be, which are part of the poetry or the narrative, for example, in uh, traditional stories or traditional poetry, but very, very hard to put into paper, very hard to place into another language. So again, I see a common thread between these two, especially Martin and, and, and Sophie, in describing the challenges of translating orality onto, uh, into writing. However, that links very well also uh, with the larger uh, 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 questions about, about uh, writing itself. Uh, as Octavio Paz, the Mexican uh, poet and, and, and writer says, writing itself is a form of translation. Okay? You actually, you know, you know, anytime you write, you're translating the thoughts, you're translating the culture, you're translating so many things onto paper. And therefore, in itself, that is a form of translation. So it's, it's not just about what we do as professional translators, but also each one of us on a day-to-day -day basis is also a translator. And this is particularly uh, uh, um, uh, uh, important in the case of Africa, because which how many of us Africans are not, not multilingual? We are mostly multilingual. Many people in Africa speak not one, two, or three languages. And what happens? Whatever language we choose to write in, we are constantly translating. If I choose to write in English, I have to think about some things in Swahili, some things in Kikuyu, maybe some things in Spanish as well. And therefore, this is a reality for all, all of us. And it, is, it cannot be gainsaid the importance of our all understanding that translation plays a very big role in our lives, whether or not we are actually doing a, a translation as professionals. So um, putting meaning into what was said, again, that's something that Sophie, uh, uh, that caught my attention uh, from Sophie's presentation. Um, <clears throat> and beyond that, her point about a, a blind reproduction of knowledge. And this ties in with also what uh, uh, my colleague Kojo brought up uh, 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 thereafter, that there has to be meaningful translation. And also, Wangoi has just brought it up towards her at the end of the discussion. What choices do we have to make in translating? What books shall we translate? Are we going to shy away from some or, and so forth? So these decisions, I mean, this is a common thread that I can see throughout this uh, particular discussion. Well, uh, Kojo, uh, my colleague here, brought up also the point about translating culture. But more importantly, I think the first time I heard about the discussion about multilingualism and the relevance of translation. Yeah? What are the meaningful translations that we need to come, we, we, what are the texts that we need to select in order to, to translate? The fidelity to our languages and cultures. And the question that arises here, I wasn't sure whether what, what, what direction that uh, Koji was, 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 was taking us, um, is, is uh, translation, uh, rather, um, um, yes, is multilingualism a bulwark right, or a barrier? Okay? I got a sense that you, you know, it can act as both. Okay? It can be a seen, mostly, of us, many of us see multilingualism as a barrier to communication, to good communication. It is expensive to translate back and forth. Uh, we have too many languages to deal with, 400 in Nigeria, you know, 65 in Kenya, 125 in Tanzania. How do we do all this? Shall we become a wholly monolingual world in favor of one of these languages of wider communication, such as Swahili or Hausa or Yoruba, or shall we try to deal with all the languages at once, or shall we revert to the ex-colonial languages and say, oh, look, we have a ready choice here. Let's use English, let's use French, let's use Spanish. These are serious questions that have to come. And therefore, this is why I think, uh, you know, uh, we can look at this multilingualism, A, as a barrier to communication, but also, I think you suggested that it can also be a bulwark to preventing our total real neo-colonization of our minds, because I think there is also that danger that if we give out everything, if we do not retain any of, our, uh, uh, of what we have, we might end up with a, what uh, Harish Trivedi described as, as a whole monolingual, monocultural, monocultivated world that speaks English or French or German, something like that. So uh, these are important questions, and nicely summarized by Wangoi here. Uh, but also, who also brought up a very important point about translators' invisibility. I think increasingly, translators are becoming more visible, right? 
I think for the tradition has always been that a translator should remain invisible. All right? You do the translation, make it so clean and so unnoticeably translated, right? we don't want to hear it was a translation. So for a long time, this has been tradition. So in many cases, even the name of the translator may not be very seen as very important. Now, I think the recognition of the translator as a rewriter, translation as a rewriting exercise that involves omissions, additions, redefinitions, moving around, dislocations of, of, of the grammar. This is now becoming a lot more recognized as serious, intellectual input to the extent that now there is no longer the need to hide the translator. So I was very pleased when you asked translators in the room to raise their hands because not only uh, on text but also in a physical kind of way. So I think these are very important questions which can be brought forward. Finally, I think Wangui also brought up uh, very important issues about the 1962 conference. I agree with her that uh, perhaps in another organization of a similar conference as we have today would involve more of the actual participants, because they're still around, there are many of them, as, as we have seen. Uh, I think it would be, uh, they, they have a lot more stories, such as we had this morning with one of the, present, uh, with the, with the, with the speakers today, and a bit we heard from uh, Professor Shoyinka uh, in, in, in the lunchtime conversations. We've had some conversations with James and others, you know, who are in the room here. Very interesting stories the backdrop to this 1962 conference about which we do not have to guess because the wilderness of, the event, of the, those events are, are still with us here today. And so the true voices are important to be heard. I think that point about 1962 being an important point of decolonizing the curriculum in East Africa in Africa, very crucial. We cannot ignore that, that this conference paved the way for all of us now to actually read the relevant books for Africa, Chinua, Chebe, Ngorua, Thiongo, and so on and so forth. Okor Pibitek, of course. In my own high school, we all grew up on uh, uh, Okor Pibitek and Ngorua, Thiongo. Without this particular event, obviously, this may have taken another decade or two. So it's an important point that was raised here by Wangoi this morning, this afternoon. Right, questions of uh, authentic authenticity has been raised again, and this came up earlier this morning. It goes back to the question of language, right? Which language we are writing in? Are we authentic enough if we are writing in ex-colonial languages? Or is it by writing in an African language only that one can be authentic? I think that's an ongoing discussion. It's not something that I can summarize in any way right here. So I think that historical perspective in addition to the question of ethics of translation, the choice of texts, very important. And finally, that little point about the realization that there, are, there is something called untranslatability. And that's another big point of content, uh, discussion which can go on and on for more. Uh, but I will leave that now for uh, the general discussion to uh, which maybe these questions can be raised more. Thank you very much for this.